good evening. How is everyone? A little rainy, a little damp. We made it. Uh, my name is Sam. Welcome to Data and Society. How many of you, show of hands, have been here before? Awesome. And how many of you are first timers tonight? Welcome, welcome, welcome. So I'm the Director of Communications and Creative Engagement here at Data and Society, and it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you for this panel inspired by Logic Magazine's latest issue, number seven, China. We are thrilled to welcome Jing Su, Fei Liu, and Julian Gerwitz, as previously announced, and we send our best to Christina Larson, who unfortunately cannot be with us tonight. But we are very happy to share that Moira Weigel, the co-editor of the issue, is here as moderator. So for those of you who, this is my brief plug, and then we'll get to some housekeeping details and start things off. If you don't know us, we are an independent nonprofit research institute, and we're focused on the social and cultural issues arising from data-centric and automated technologies. So we have researchers here who are looking at issues ranging from health and data to labor futures, disinformation, AI, algorithmic accountability, et cetera. And if you are here this evening, you belong in our network. We would love to stay in touch. Brief plug, our Twitter handle is at Data Society, and hashtag Data Bytes is how you can tag and talk about anything that you hear tonight. Our website is www.datasociety.net. Um, very briefly, housekeeping. To the back and two left, there are two gender neutral, uh, gender neutral bathrooms. And our talk tonight will be live streamed and available to watch afterwards as well. If you are shy about being recorded, um, think about that in Q&A. And the wonderful Hannah is our photographer tonight. Um, if you want to opt out of photos, we will be reviewing them before using or releasing anything. You should be able to put a red dot on your name tag and we will respect that. If you get caught in the photo, we'll find it. Don't worry, if you have any concerns, come talk to me. And last but not least, the amazing Ben Tarnoff is here selling amazing issues of Logic magazines for $15. Digital copy, copies are available online for five bucks, but look at these beautiful things. You want to take one home. They're really lovely, thick, heavy, and there are some back issues as well. If you're feeling spendy, they do take credit cards. All right, that's my capitalist plug. So I'd now like to turn it over to Logic co-founder Moira Weigel to tell us more about this issue and introduce our speakers for the evening. And Moira is a postdoctoral scholar at the Harvard Society of Fellows and the author of Labor of Love, The Invention of Dating. Over to you. Thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? Is that the right? feeling short. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, and thank you to Data and Society for hosting us. I feel as if this is an organization we feel a lot of kinship with. We follow your work, and it's exciting to get to do an event here. I feel as if Sam did uh, some of the work I was going to do introducing the magazine, but as, as Sam said, Logics, they're here uh, by my co-founder, Ben Tarnoff. We're a magazine about technology. Uh, have folks read Logic or encountered Logic? Some of you. Um, great. We publish three times a year, and you can also find a lot of our content on our website, uh, logicmag.io. Uh, I think actually my co-editor on the issue, Julian, is going to do some introducing of the content. So I think without further ado, I will introduce our speakers, and then we can get right into it. Julian Gewertz is an academy scholar at the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies and a lecturer on history at Harvard University. He's the author of Unlikely Partners, Chinese Reformers, Western Economists, and The Making of Global China, which came out from Harvard University Press in 2017. His research has been published in the Journal of Asian Studies, The American Scholar, and Foreign Affairs, and his poems have appeared in the Boston Review, The Nation, New Republic, and Pen America. Jing Tzu, next to Julian, is a literary scholar and cultural historian of modern China at Yale University. She's the first person to be tenured and become professor of Chinese literature and comparative literature at Yale, 
and is the author of four books, two co-edited. She is currently writing a new book, which I've been dying to read for ages, I'm very excited for, about how China entered the IT era, the kingdom of characters, language wars, and China's rise to global power. It's a remarkable tale that uncovers what happened to the Chinese script in the age of the Western alphabet. Fei Lu on the right, I guess my right, your left, is a New York-based Chinese designer, artist, writer, and DJ exploring digital empathy and the narrative potential of interfaces. She's an adjunct professor at Parsons MFA Design and Technology, and previously a researcher in residence at New Inc., and a digital solitude fellow at Academy Schloss Solitude in Stuttgart, Germany. Let's give them a round of applause and get into the conversation. Thanks, Moira, and thanks again to Data and Society for having us here. So I'm really glad that all of you have come and joined us for what is certainly, in some ways unfortunately, a very timely topic. We're, we're celebrating this new logic issue, as you know, but we're also trying to deepen the conversation a bit incorporating the kind of social and cultural and historical perspectives that may not always end up in presidential tweets. <laughs> I Thank you, Maura. Uh, I want to start by raising just a few issues to frame our discussion before Jing and Fei give their talks. So this event is focusing on what we call the new global map that Chinese tech is drawing. So there can be no question that Chinese technology is spreading globally, whether it's Huawei hardware or TikTok app downloads. And as we write in this new logic issue, this raises the question of where exactly the Chinese internet is. Big tech firms founded on both sides of the Pacific are now transnational corporations. So what do we really mean when we use phrases like American technology or Chinese technology? one of the themes that we'll discuss today. Now, of course, in both countries, tech is connected to the state and influenced by the government. In China, as all of you know, it's bound up in the Chinese Communist Party's authoritarianism. This has at least two important facets. One is censorship and the, the control of information. This is also about keeping out the world, separating China's digital space from the outside world. Next week, for instance, on June 4th, the world will commemorate the 30th anniversary of the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown. But those remembrances will be invisible from within the Great Firewall. In The Logic Issue, there's a fascinating piece by the Chinese feminist activist Lu Pin on these themes in connection to, to China's feminist movement and the website she founded, Feminist Voices. Another aspect to that connection between the state and technology is using digital technologies to facilitate or enhance or even revolutionize the Chinese Communist Party's repression and control of society. So some have called this digital authoritarianism. This is a phrase that I'm sure many of you have heard in circulation. Uh, the western province of Xinjiang has become, for instance, a digital police state targeting Uyghurs and other Muslims. There's an extraordinary and moving piece by Darren Byler in this issue. Uh, he's an anthropologist, and he shows not just how these technologies of surveillance work in practice, but also how they're designed for export, another way in which this is a global map. Now, as all of you know, there's tremendous attention in Washington right now on the idea that Chinese technology is inherently a threat to the United States. The current trade war is not just a trade war. It's also a conflict over systems of political economy and technology and society. The United States government's concerns basically flow from concern about the Chinese Communist Party and the political and economic system that it runs in China. For example, are private companies truly private? Are Chinese technology firms, as they go global, somehow proxies for the Chinese party state? Then there's the idea of a so-called new Cold War, 
which is in really wide circulation. I think, and, and I think many of us have, have the view that this has real shortcomings as a framework. But one genuine similarity is that US-China competition won't only affect the United States and China. It will also hugely affect the rest of the world. And this isn't just because of, for instance, supply chains, topic much discussed among, among US government officials. It's also because this global reach may play out in ways that the politicos who are ramping up this uh, new Cold War rhetoric may not expect. Just take the much discussed question of 5G. As some commentators have noted, uh, for many developing countries, the decisive factor may simply be which supplier is better value for money. After all, they may believe that both countries are pretty capable of spying on them. Third, one of the most extraordinary stories that often gets lost in the headlines about tech in China is just how much diversity, creativity, contradiction, and dynamism there is. I think this comes through powerfully in the logic issue. It's one theme that I hope you all will look for when you read it. Uh, for example, Christina Xu has an essay on bullet comments, where you get a sense of the chaotic ferment of discussion, debate, commentary uh, that, that happens in, in watching videos and other content online in real time. Faye will talk about some of these themes. And uh, the Chinese science fiction writer Chen Fan has an essay about his experience as a Chinese visitor with a group of other Chinese visitors at Burning Man. We're currently at a moment of intense global geopolitical tensions, but that shouldn't cause us to see China or Chinese tech as a monolith. In a way, I think that's the most fundamental thesis, if it can be said to have a thesis, of this issue. To do so, to, to see China and Chinese technology in that way would certainly overlook the Chinese makers and entrepreneurs who are hustling just as hard as their counterparts in the US. Uh, and it would overlook the almost 800 million internet users in China who go online to have fun or learn or shop or chat. So with that, uh, I will turn over to our next speaker, Jane, and I look forward to a spirited discussion. Um, as, first of all, thank you for coming, and thanks to Moira and Julian and Ben for putting this together. As U.S.-China trade war is about to hit another critical point, it may be odd that I'm asking you to think about emerging technology as a kind of emerging nations project. Why do I say that? Because in many ways, this is how China thinks of itself at the moment. It is the evolving global power with evolving strategies. It is also emergent because it's trying to redefine itself in relation to an established order that is headed by the West or the US. And to, in some ways, explain how this is, I'd like to take you back a little bit further back in time, not that much further, um, to 1974, to a project called 748. This is actually China's first state-led science technology project with a very specific goal. And that's the beginning of the computing age, internet, all that kind of stuff. And it's about something very basic, how to get the Chinese writing system into the computer. Now, if you think about it for a moment, all the global communications technology that we have, telegraphs, typewriters, computers, keyboards, none of it was designed with Chinese language or even non-Western languages in mind. But to enter the information age, the cyber age, is it incredibly important to get their language into the system. So China spent quite a few arduous years developing this. Now, 74, I remind you, is also, we're still in during Cultural Revolution. And a lot of this encoding process, right, try, how do we break down Chinese character into ways that's kind of like alphabet, but Chinese doesn't have 26 letters, right? It has thousands of characters. How do you make them behave like an alphabet and to enter on a keyboard was a critical challenge. Now, there was a man who was in prison during the Cultural Revolution. Um, he was thrown into what was called the cow shed at the time, which is any of these makeshift prisons that you can just throw someone in for an indefinite amount of time. And he actually, to make his imprisonment unbearable, he spent his time encoding every single Chinese character that he could come up with 
from memory. So he came up with thousands of them. So after Cultural Revolution, he was celebrated, made the front page of People's, People's Daily, and it was the headline was, finally, Chinese character enters the computing age. There was just one problem. The computing technology in China was not anywhere up to the level where it can be to operationalize Chinese encoding system. Now, it just so happens that in 1979, there was this nonprofit organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, called Graphic Arts Research Foundation, GARF. Now, GARF already started in 1959 or so, trying to develop Chinese language computing system. They actually did have some help from some key Chinese American scientists, which I won't go into here. But the man who developed it, who got credit for it, Samuel Caldwell, unfortunately died after the prototype came out. He died a year later. So this project was kind of suspended, and Garf was biding his time, trying to figure out when to rally again. So in 1979, they invited a group of Chinese, a Chinese delegation to the United States and demonstrated this prototype by now 20 some years old, and told them that we would really like to help you in some ways operationalize your Chinese encoding system by building it into this prototype. Everything went beautifully. They were in the press. There was a lot of mutual admiration, friendship. The Chinese were very excited about it. They gave him the system that was developed by this man in prison. So Garver's pretty excited too, because they get to rally again. This is gonna be their, their, their project, because frankly, after that, nothing really happened. For 20 years, they were trying to figure out what to do next. And by this time, of course, different kinds of Western companies were also trying to get into Chinese computing market, right, as an emerging technology, including Monotype in England. So everything was all good in 79. They were gonna go back in 1980 and sign and basically come up with this joint venture. It's going to be the model for all subsequent China-US scientific exchange. So they go back in November, December 1980, and they sat down at the negotiation table, and the Chinese seemed to have changed their mind. They didn't want to pay for anything. They demanded full technological transfer, down to the blueprints and the drawings. They wanted um, to have Chinese send their engineers to the US to be trained for a couple of years for free. And their argument was, well, we gave you this Chinese encoding technology, right? We gave you the encoding. Otherwise, you're just a computing technology, essentially. So what happened in 78, 79? Well, as China opened itself up, right? This is the moment where we think of Deng Xiaoping's reform era as sort of 1982, 83, but it really started basically essentially right after Mao died. And Chinese leadership had a very distinct idea that they were going to use, they had to use something else to fill the ideological vacuum that was left by Mao and obviously the Cultural Revolution and the destruction they left. And they decided it would be science technology. But what happened in the opening up was they realized as all these Western firms approached them, the Chinese realized we have an edge, right? We can actually do it cheaper, better, and maybe faster because they have the technology, but they can't adapt it to Chinese needs. Only we can do that. Now I say this because also this is part of the self-reliance mentality that actually was, became deeply ingrained after, after China and the Soviet Union had this falling out in 1960. Um, China very much dependent on the Soviet Union for its technological innovations and training. And when the Soviets pulled out, they left hundreds of very critical projects unmanned. And China suffered very deeply for that so they have vowed never again they would become self-reliant. So what did that really mean for them? It doesn't mean that they're gonna come up with their own original ideas, right? It doesn't mean that they're gonna think in a vacuum, but it does mean that any time they encounter technology in the West, they're going to bend it to serve their needs. They're going to tailor it, right? They don't, they're gonna customize it. And the reason 748 is so important is because that is really the beginning, and I think early stages of how China will interact with Western technology again and again and again and again. Um, you have to think of it in terms of the mentality of an underdog in the 70s, right? From China's advantage or their vantage point, as kind of the latecomer, as kind of disadvantage, you can use anything, right? You can copy, you can maybe steal, um, you can do whatever you need to do to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. This is a very different kind of approach to technology. So in some ways, now when we think about emerging technology, and we think of these very incremental 
or very discreet technologies that China's doing that seemed wow inspiring and incredible. Very few of us think of it in this larger framework, right? Of how, when we think about China US technology and how it's interacting, we forget that China has a much more concerted global strategy and vision of where it's going, right? Innovation for China is not something that is left to individual creativity necessarily. It is about more control. Innovation is a necessity. And we say the Cold War as a way of describing why, how China is using its technology to basically set a new standard in the world today. For China, that's actually just a form of self-reliance, right? When we think about privacy, China thinks access and convenience. And when we think about surveillance, China thinks governance. Now, what I'm describing here is really a way of flipping the way we think um, about even how we use it to criticize or try to tease out other kinds of vantage points in this picture. And in some ways, I think when we think about technology, we've been very resistant to doing that because that means that we think more like them. Whereas all this time for four decades, we figured China would think more like us, right? As we sort of exchange and as they capitalize and democratize. But as we can see since the 70s, that was never China's goal, right? It knew what it had to do. It knew that it had to learn from the outside, borrow Western tech, but it never in its mind thought for a moment that it would become more like the West. Um, now, many of you who saw the headlines last week, um, Hike Vision, which is a company, the leading global surveillance company, actually they do video um, um, uh, basic cameras, that this is a company that's been associated with uh, surveillance in Xinjiang, so on and so forth. And it is now going to be blacklisted, right? Possibly banned, uh, together with Dahua. But what people don't see from the outside is High Vision has been preparing this for about a year now. And High Vision is one of these institutes that actually is a company, but is spun out of a state institution called the 52nd Research Institute, which if you trace it all the way up the family tree, has the exact same root as a Chinese computing. Um, Project 748. So in many ways, when we talk about US-China, China does not have US as its only counterpart, right? Um, for them, domestic competition is much more vital and important than US competition. They're not worried about that. It will hurt their market, but it doesn't hurt their core technology. And companies like Huawei and so on and so forth, Huawei is a little more dependent, but the core technology hike vision is actually completely domestic. And Dahua, in some ways, is actually, Dahua, in fact, it is, it's a competitor. So there's a lot of sort of nuance on the ground that we don't see as well when we talk about emerging technologies. And what I'm asking you to do today, I think some of to frame some of our conversations, is to think about what it means from China's perspective, right? Not necessary to take it, but I think in order to understand how consistently China has pursued its science technology um, status or ambition in the world for half a century now, it's been remarkably present. So with that, I will turn it over to Fei, who will tell us more specifically how this is. Kind of like a roundabout way of talking about it, um, not really specific. But um, speaking of underdogs, I really like um, what you said, Jing, about that. Um, I'm going to talk about an under frog, um, which is <laughs> I'm going to speak a little bit about this zine that I made, um, which is like a documentation um, of how Pepe became uh, like famous in China. So I'm going to pass one of these around so you guys could take a look at it because it's quite ta uh, like physical and tactile. Hi, um, so my name is Fei. Um, I'm an artist and a designer, so I'm not an academic at all of like Chinese tech history, but um, I wanted to share a little bit um, about this project. Um, so I really didn't know what I was doing when I made this zine. I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a zine and it's gonna be about Pepe, because I saw um, in my family's WeChat messages a photo of a little girl drawing by hand this Pepe meme and like coloring it, it in. And I was just really confused because I had no idea at that time that Pepe um, was at all known uh, in China. So for those of you who are back there, you can see that this is the cover of the zine. Um, you can see that has Chinese and English on it, um, as well as a uh, traced over 
image of um, one of the kind of more famous mutations of, of uh, Pepe in China, which is that he's mutated now to a crocodile. Um, and he's so sad that he just had to mutate, like all of his cells just mutated, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I, and I really want to thank um, Data Society and Logic Magazine for this opportunity to kind of reflect um, post-mortem about like why I did this. Um, and I think that it's, uh, in, in light of all that, I think what I realized is Pepe really, you know, um, has this unifying power of like cross-national collaboration and narrative crafting. Um, which I think is, is interesting when we think about um, the dangers that China poses, right? Like, do we always think of our collaborators as, as opponents um, versus collaborators? Um, and so I'm just gonna talk a little bit. Okay, who, who doesn't know the history of Pepe? Oh, okay, a few people, all right, good, okay. Um, so uh, Pepe, you know, here. Um, is a character that the comic artist uh, Matt Fury created in 2006 or five, I believe. Um, and okay, but before all that, um, I did not let Matt Fury know that I made a zine of his Pepe until someone tagged him on my Instagram post. It was like, it's okay, I'm his cousin, like he's totally chill. Um, so now he knows and that's that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so um, Boys Club is you know, where Pepe first appeared. And in 2008, he really uh, grew in internet popularity on MySpace, uh, Gaia Online, and 4chan. Um, and by 2015, he became one of the most uh, popularly used um, you know, images or memes uh, on 4chan and Tumblr. Um, so there's different types of species, like meme species of Pepe. There's the sad frog, the smug frog, the angry frog, the feels frog, and the you will never dot 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 frog. Um, and in 2014, there was this um, ability to buy like rare Pepe memes from the meme market, sort of like trading cards. Um, does anyone, anyone ever own one? Oh, all right, all right, cool. Okay, you can tell us about that later if you want. Um, and so, you know, as, as most of us know, like many of us don't know the history of Pepe, but we know how he kind of rose to infamy um, in the elections. So, you know, Donald Trump posted this image um, on his Instagram and Twitter, uh, sort of making fun of Hillary Clinton's comment um, basket of deplorables, uh, you know, with uh, Trump and then Trump frog, I guess, um, photoshopped onto the deplorables. Um, and that's you know his family and whatnot. Um, and then the next image comes a little bit with a trigger warning because um, it does feature like a white nationalist imagery, but I'm just going to show it really quick. Um, so Pepe, like loving loving Pepe, became appropriated by the alt right, um, and you can see him wearing a bunch of uh, you know uh, uniforms, I guess, um, and then. He became, you know, used in uh, alt-right protests. So he physically appeared in some of these um, protests that people were doing. Um, and so I wanted to, yeah, to not segue, but um, there's this amazing book uh, written by um, Anxiao Mina, and it's called Memes to Movements. And just um, from that image, you can see how sometimes like the things that we make online like do show up in person, and how important that is um, to redefining like what these memes are. So I'll pass this around too. I'm basically a billboard today, so you can just see all these things. Um, yeah, super illuminating book about um, yeah from memes to movements uh, across the the globe, um, and it. It really got me thinking about how visual culture, the internet, and people are always trying to steer um, the narrative. And as you can see, Pepe in the 2016 elections, um, like she makes a really salient point here that the battle for his representation um, from you know the sort of gentle uh, one that you know Matt Fury intended for him to have in a Boys Club um, to you know to being a symbol of the alt right really is like the battle that we have for for um, and of democracy. So I'm just gonna read um, a quick quote from her book. Um, Networks of memes invariably take on a life of their own, and there will always be another remix on top of the remixes of the remixes, creating a seemingly endless tree of variation that snakes back on itself. This is part of what makes meme culture work. It's a shift from sh um, static notions of media consumption towards more dynamic ones of both consumption and production. 
Sometimes this allows marginalized communities to challenge dominant narratives and shape new ones. Other times, like during elections, a multiplicity of memes appears with no clear consensus. This especially reflects life in a democracy where competing views and perspectives are not just expected, but also encouraged. In theory, this is what should make a democracy function, in theory. Um, so in 2016, um, on the website The Nib, Matt Fury drew this piece called Pepe the Frog to Sleep Perchance to Meme. Um, and basically, Pepe realizes, you know, like what he is now standing for and uh, is so traumatized that he, he can't sleep. Um, which leads to the next year, uh, Matt Fury actually kills Pepe um, in like a one-off comic, and uh, you know his his friends like pour beer into his coffin, and like that's kind of that's kind of how he wanted Pepe to be remembered, right? As like this sad but kind of nice frog, um, and there was like this uh, Save Pepe Kickstarter campaign to resurrect him in his own comic book um, to reclaim his status as a universal symbol for peace, love, and acceptance. So it's not, I'm not really clear about how Pepe um, actually came to China, but here he is um, in WeChat, in a WeChat sticker pack, and then a QQ um, sticker pack here on the right. Uh, who has WeChat on their phones? Cool. Um, so what, what I think is really interesting about WeChat and Pepe is that WeChat's like this very mainstream app, right, that we use to talk to our friends, our family, pay the rent for our landlords, like whatever, right? And, and that's very different than how Pepe was used in, I, I guess, the States, like starting out on 4chan, on uh, Gaia Online, I don't even know what that is, but, but um, you know, those are very specific um, technologies that you use to talk to very specific people. And so I think um, him becoming a sticker pack really normalized and kind of mainstreamed his existence, right? Like you could send these to basically anyone, it wasn't just like your, four, your 4chan friends. Um, that you would use him with. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, okay, so, and, and this next, uh, so this next image is um, from a blog, and basically they're just mourning the death of Pepe, who to them actually represented this, um, this like really magical tool for a uh, dueling social capital. Um, so it says here, um, so that means like, like this is the, the magical tool that I have to like battle images with. And like battling images basically is just sending stickers between friends and like seeing who is more funny or like more interesting. Um, and so maybe kind of represents not only like do they like him because he's sad, but also represents like a way to be creative yourself and a way to like one up your friends. Um, and so they were just really mourning the death of him because it's like their identity, you know, that they were also mourning. Um, so, yeah, uh, the reason why I made the scene again is because I saw my um, my stepmother's niece <laughs> drawing him. So here she is. Um, and so you can see, like, you know, what kind of what kind of uh, meme translations there are. Um, and I think this is maybe like a, a little personal note, but I think the reason why he also was adopted so lovingly is because his name is like two of the same characters, like Pepe, and like in Chinese, every, or not everyone, lots of people have nicknames that are like the two characters repeated. Like actually my full name is Fei Fei, and I hate that, but there's something amenable there. I think it's like fate, you know, that we're like uh, cutified or something. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it, it's interesting because with Pepe, like there's a, um, an allowing of the interplay between like fact and fiction, um, and then thinking about like accessibility and consumption and production, the lack of ownership, and like the potential for this cross um, geopolitical communication, um, makes me think about. I'm gonna skip a little bit. Um, is like the way that news was first produced, like in the eight, uh, 19th century, I think, um, in uh, the UK where news ballads um, were sung for the illiterate. And so 
these things actually contained like actual events, but also contained like folklore and like supernatural happenings. Um, and this is kind of a way that like novels actually gained traction. So people were writing news, but also writing novels, and they're, they're sort of like a blending of the same thing. Um, and the way that it's sung made it accessible for people who couldn't read, right? Which is kind of what I think like making memes is in a way. You're trying to capture a fact, but you're not necessarily um, like you don't have to be, you don't have to do like a deep fake of Obama's face, you know, in order to create this artifact. Like you could just use, um, you know, something very simple. Um, and then, okay, so, so here I wanted to show the first, I think, meme that ever was made, um, and it kind of also speaks to like solidarity across across nations. Um, so this is the Australian uh, foo was here. Um, which was chalked on the side of railway carriages and uh, appeared in a lot of um, camps during the first uh, wor like World War I. Um, and I think that foo represents a forward observation officer. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting image that then into, uh, in World War II became Mr. Chad. Um, and Mr. Chad often was written or was signed with this phrase that says, what, no T? Um, <laughs> And, and then the next one, next to Mr. Chad, is um, Kilroy was here, which is like kind of the American version of Mr. Chad. And both of these were used in World War II, and they were associated with GIs in the 1940s. Um, so I think like the first meme, it kind of speaks to comfort and like solidarity across people enduring this like physical hardship. Um, and so I wonder like what would memes be like or what would these things be like without um, a sharing of like physical presence and pain, I guess. Um, and so thinking about that, I wanted to mention J.S. Chen's article that um, he wrote uh, recently on Jacobin where he speaks about um, uh, 996.ICU. I don't know if everyone knows what that is, but um, it's an initiative um, that's on GitHub right now. Um, and I'll let, I'm going to read JS's article, parts of it. Yeah. Um, so the article is titled Tech Workers Are Workers Too. Okay, so I'm going to start now. Last month, tech workers in China put together a project on GitHub a global software service and code collaboration platform, calling for companies to end 996. Chinese tech workers have coined the term to describe the grueling practice of working 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. A few, day, a few weeks after the 996.ICU project's release on GitHub, the tech companies Tencent and Alibaba blocked the project on their own web browsers, a blatant attempt to censor the effort. Their attempts to quash the project proved ineffective, though, as both companies only boast a minority share of browser usage in China. The best way to censor the project was to do so directly at the source. Since the code sharing platform is owned by Microsoft, they would need the Washington-based company to remove the project on GitHub. Aware that Microsoft was likely face, already facing pressure to censor the project, Microsoft workers released a letter published on GitHub demanding that the company keep it uncensored and accessible. The letter called on other tech workers around the world, GitHub's primary user base, to join them. Um, and so you can see that already a meme is being created kind of with GitHub's uh, Octocat and then that um, ICU uh, blood infusion dripper thing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so I guess like the, I, I guess this uh, Pepe kind of encapsulates this ability for us to sort of see across whether or not we think that another nation is our competitor or not. But like. Um, like workers are workers and we need to unite around that no matter what our political leanings are, no matter what our um, nationality is, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's kind of something that I wanted to represent with the physical Pepe zine as well, um, is that you know we can bring people together, we can make things tangible, and that's why it's a coloring book. Um, there's sort of like this intergenerational aspect to it because there's two flashcards where you can learn how to pronounce um, the characters that are on that page. Like if you've, if you've never been able to say certain things to your parents, for example, now you can learn them through this Pepe flashcard. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I wanted to show that we could like remix the world by adding this other physical layer to it. Um, and so let's uh, mutate together. Thank you. <laughs>
How's that? <laughs> Thank you so much, all of you, for your presentations. I've come with a bunch of questions I wanted to ask these folks, uh, but I also could bother them anytime, and I would like for you all to have lots of time to ask questions. So I think I'll just ask one or two uh, that you as a group could respond to quickly and then open up the floor. I feel as if when we were putting together this issue, when we were first talking about it, and you're all involved in it in some way, we wanted to try to move beyond these kinds of bipolar worlds, certain kinds of cliches about differences between Chinese culture and American culture in tech that feel very well established and reified in American media. And one cliche that we talked about was had to do with creativity. And we feel as if that's really changed in just the past couple years, but even you know, as recently as 2012, 2013, when I was in Beijing, I remember attending events where people said, you know, oh, can Chinese tech be creative? Or is, you know, is Chinese tech always going to be? There's this term, Shanghai bootleg, you know, sort of knockoffs of American tech. Baidu is copying Google, so on. These debates seem ridiculous now, I think, to anyone who spent time on the Chinese internet. But I was curious um, whether, and maybe Faye's talk, talk on, touched on this most directly, but I imagine you all have things to say about it, whether there's a distinctively Chinese culture of innovation or whether you're thinking about these questions in new ways, whether it's precisely in the cross-cultural contact that you see the most, the most innovative and creative possibility, um, whether you could speak to that and the reversal of that sort of big narrative a bit. Or anyone, I didn't mean to put Faye on the spot. <laughs> anyone can speak about it. Oh, okay, she named me. Um. <laughs> well, I think, I think what's kind of interesting too is, um, I, and I heard this comment sort of anecdotally, is that, Sorry, just <laughs> it's, it's a little tangential. But my friend works in fashion. He worked at opening ceremony. And then he had this opinion that um, there was no market, there's no Chinese fashion design market at all um, because Chinese people are, quote, unquote, not creative. And um, I think that in conversation, there, there was this thing that was brought up is that at a certain point in time, like, no one thought that the Italians had a fashion market. And, like, look how, I mean, how wrong that is, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's that... In the eyes of certain, uh, in the eyes of like certain times or certain groups in power, like we always want to think that so and so are not creative, yeah. because to be human is to be creative, and so therefore these pe people are somehow subhuman. Um, and at that time it was Italians, now it's the Chinese. It's going to be someone else next. Um, and so I think that I, I don't know. I, I think that um, at any point maybe we can ask ourselves like, oh, we're so and so creative. Like it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. No. And I feel as if that narrative has really changed in yeah. the past few years, even in these sort of oversimplified media presentations. Sorry, Jing, what were you going to say? It's interesting to think about what innovation actually really means. Right. Because certainly in Chinese context, we think of it as having had this phase of imitation, mm -hmm. but then they end up doing it better. And to cite my favorite crackpot theorist, 19th century, Gabriel Tard, a French <laughs> social theorist, he wrote a whole treatise about imitation innovation. And he always argued that real innovation is not recognizable. What we consider as new is something that's very familiar, but just that much more, you know, has a little bit more of a kick to it. So in many ways, all innovations are some type of copy in some ways. And I think for China in particular, innovation is, they, they don't need to be 100%, right? They just need to mass scale it. They can do it much better that way. And that to them is a kind of innovation because that suits their needs best. I just wanted to add one point, which is that innovation in this rhetoric, I mean, I completely agree with what the other panelists have said, but it has been co-opted by the state and by the Chinese Communist Party, which now says it wants to build a strong, innovative nation. And I think we can ask also what that means. So I think what, what, what Jing has said is, is spot on. I would go one step farther, though, and say, so one of the big innovations that gets talked about coming from China is the mobile payments ecosystem, the ability to pay you know, for everything with a QR code. And if I were sitting in Zhongnanhai in the Chinese leadership compound, the lesson that I would draw about that is a bit complicated because the reason that mobile payments were able to develop so uh, rapidly and openly in China is that foreign credit card companies, foreign payment services were blocked. Visa, if Visa and MasterCard had been allowed into China much earlier, we might have seen a different, a different history there. And you know, so this cuts both ways depending on where you sit, I think, as, as Jing was, was illuminating earlier. 
Uh, one of the challenging questions when we think about innovation is, of course, it's ridiculous to say that China or Chinese people can't innovate. Of course they can. But equally, there are political and economic dimensions to it that do tend to polarize or push uh, these, two, these two societies more apart. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in that because I wonder, in, instead of saying like who is more innovative, maybe it's like who has the most restrictions and like what can come out of those environments. Like, no. It does seem like one of the antithesis we're assuming is that innovation and control don't go together. But we've consistently seen Chinese government's response to innovation is great. We'll give you conditions to be innovative. That's why this company I mentioned, Hike Vision, spun out of the 52nd Research Institute because they wanted them to do the consumer end of the product and technology. Right, and this very notion that control and creativity are somehow inherently opposed is itself a sort of provincial American notion in its way. Or maybe is that too far? Is that farther than what you're saying? I think that's why I was trying to flip our way of thinking in terms of these categories, because it is true. Even the ways in which we are asking questions about China, it reflects our values, right? We value privacy. For a country that's come out of decades of surveillance where neighbors, students tell on teachers, children tell on their parents, right, neighbors tell on each other, like that is a, is, it is a culture that assumes they're being surveilled. So the question is whether you would think a society like that has no freedom whatsoever, or do individual agents figure out a way of navigating around that? And I think for any of us who spend time in China is that you are amazed by how in tune and how actively engaged citizens are with news, with how to make things work where they don't. Entrepreneurs that I talk to constantly find ways of around, like the trade war. You know, one of the big winners is actually Vietnam. Why? Because in October, before the end, before the year, before 2018 ended and the tariffs were gonna go up, the Chinese Chinese companies were looking for ready move-in factories in Vietnam. Spe speaking of, and I feel as if Julian, you touched on this in your opening remarks, the ways in which despite the binary sort of Cold War framing, like the Cold War, this is going to involve all kinds of different countries. I wanted to ask briefly, um, a couple of you have touched on this idea that Chinese tech is spreading globally, right? We have TikTok here now. Um, you see QR codes everywhere. I'm wondering whether you think about this in your different work as just sort of another story of capitalism and globalization, and sort of a new power globalizing, or whether they're sort of distinctive Chinese characteristics uh, to the spread of Chinese tech. Uh, I think any of you could speak to that. Julian maybe wants to go first. Sure, so I'll just quickly, I'll say, you know, from my perspective, the, the answer is, is both and, which is to say that there, you know, I mean, I mean to flow from some of what, what everyone has said, there are ways in which this is a story that really should be understood as a globalization story, China, capitalistic enterprises and behaviors in China, fueling a certain kind of globalized activity and enterprises that span transnationally. And then there's a way in which this is about a latecomer, Chinese government supported ecosystem that propels these companies forward. I think the other piece of this that I would be really interested to, to talk more about is disaggregating that category of China, you know, of, of Chinese firms and saying, you know, are there uh, regions in China, for instance, you know, regions like Shenzhen right, right across from Hong Kong or in Hangzhou where these vectors happen in a different way or happen faster than a story that we might tell that's really centered on Beijing. I think he's absolutely right. I totally agree with Julian also in his work about disaggregating the idea of China. Because you know, this idea of, let's say, creating, like keeping out Western technology to create your own Xiaomi or you know, Ch Ch you know, WeChat and whatnot. Um, protectionism, right? technology transfer, I mean, that's not a China logic. I mean, that is, that is a company logic. And I think in many ways when we are overly fixated or drawn to the idea of Chinese characteristic, we're basically assuming that it's something we don't necessarily need to know about and putting like a bin where it's just kind of like cultural difference. But I would urge that in some ways, I think it's much more useful to do like what we heard here tonight, is essentially to think of China as a kind of a company, China Inc. 
what would you do, given this is a set of parameters, what you want to achieve globally, you want to make profit, you want your firm to be profitable every quarter, you have goals, 2025, 2030. These are not so frightening as China's global ambition to swallow the world. I mean, we all do long-term planning. We plan our lives out that way. Or we all should. Yes, or we all should. Um, that kind of brings to mind this uh, thing that happened with um, a uh, artist and like um, creator named Naomi Wu, who, um, you know, really tried to, I think, um, like get away from the Western gaze upon like what um, Chinese like creators, especially women, should look like. Um, and I think that um, it's interesting because she doesn't easily fit this narrative that we have of. A, what Chinese women are and should be. Um, B, what Chinese um, innovation should look like and like what that uh, maker, maker's like scene should, should be. Um, and I think that a lot of the questions that people had about her motives and stuff were really from this like Western um, lens. And I think that at some point someone was like, who is she dating or who is she married to? Um, and it's this idea that like, like, okay, well, women can't be entrepreneurs by themselves. Like, that's a, maybe a separate point, but um, it's just like, there must be someone wealthy and more knowledgeable backing her up. And I think that's kind of interesting when we think about um, like f foreign enterprises in China is that um, there's like this Western face and then there's like the Chinese, the unknown Chinese like funder um, who is like secretly doing all of the work. Um, and I think that like her incidents kind of speaks to that in like an interesting way, um, but I, I would say that, like, I don't know, it seems like we're always looking for kind of comfortable narratives, and, and they're very binary, and so, yeah. There's a lot more I could ask you, but I imagine other folks have things they want to ask. Dana and Society Team, do you want to keep going? Yeah, the folks just want to, did they answer all your questions in that one hour, no questions left about the new global map? <laughs> Hello. Um, okay, so I think I have a question in here somewhere. Um, I'm thinking I have, I have a question for Jing. Um, so I, 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 th I think I understand like kind of the need for the for the narrative that you are telling. Um, but I, but I also wonder if that's if that's the the narrative that's needed for. Um, Kind of the tension that's happening today within between between the U.S. and China. Um, so I so I mean I guess like the way I think the, like the way I think about it is that if we take on the perspective that you know China was an emerging market back in the day and that you know American capitalism was you know was set up to to be in these emerging markets and to let capital flow and to essentially dominate them, then it does make sense. You know, that, then why can't we just simply have the argument that protectionism was needed, that that it was it was literally as, sim as simple as protecting uh, protecting the local economy. Um, so I mean, I mean, I, I think that I think that um, let's see, I, th I think that like the narrative that you told that there has been this f you know five decade um, tradition where China where China has had this firm perspective on its technological um, evolution um, is an important one, but 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 also like, is the is the story not a little bit more simple than that? More simple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in the sense of. In the sense that it is a way to fight back against kind of the the, the neoliberal move that that you know that was set up largely by American infrastructure to be to have capital flowing in emerging markets. I think in some ways, yes. I don't think the Chinese were quite thinking about neoliberalism in the 1970s, but they were certainly thinking about capitalism. This is not very much known, but there are these side conversations that Mao had where they thought capitalism would actually be inevitable. But in the meantime, they're gonna use socialism. So there's never was a kind of a, a despite a lot of the rhetoric, it's not really either or. And when I talk about China as kind of like an emerging power trying to keep Americans out, I don't mean that as a victim story. I think that's been a very important national, nationalist rhetoric to use. 
But it's really China understood to, in order to catch up, this idea of catching up is really you need to take what you need, but you also need to incubate and give yourself the conditions to develop and to perfect it. So I don't really think of it as kind of a, I'm not sure it's more simple than that. I think it's been very well thought out for a long time. And I think that's what we need to be cognizant of in many ways, because you know, we're seeing these sort of different things happening and it's kind of, actually a journalist friend of mine says it's basically a story of China big, China bad, China weird, because that's sort of everything about China has to be one of those three. But you know, this is actually just China being any kind of like sensible, rational agent trying to maximize on what it can do, what it cannot do. So. Can I just add one sentence, which is, <clears throat> I don't think the story is that simple because it is a story of both embracing and resisting the forces that you're describing. So it's not as simple as a, as a rejection via protectionism or an embrace, total embrace via neoliberal structural adjustment, et cetera. Hi, thank you everyone for um, being here and sharing your reflections. It's really interesting. Uh, my question is uh, looking a bit more towards uh, where we are right now in the future. So we've talked a lot about um, sort of the, um, you know, Chinese perspective on like imitating and trying to approve upon. Um, and now as sort of the narrative is changing around Chinese tech, what are um, maybe some of the things that uh, we're learning in the US or in different Western countries from these Chinese technological, technological advancements? And what are sort of, uh, you know, uh, different, uh, you know, beings from the internet like Pepe that we see coming from China uh, to the U.S. right now. Oh no, uh, you go ahead, you go ahead. I'm still thinking. Um, are you talking about what, what the West is actually, what we're actually learning from Chinese technology? You know, well right now as we speak, I think it's a little too soon to know what exactly. I think now, basically there are two different camps. There are those who just think this is horrible, we gotta keep China out, they're you know, the villains, so on and so forth. And it's like, no, we should learn something, we need to understand China more. And so it's a very friendly gesture also because of trying to get further into the Chinese market. Um, and right now, I think there was just a, an article in The Economist about how Western firms actually, they want, they admire, they want Chinese technology. But what that's gonna avail them is unclear at this point. Because um, I don't think Chinese will give away their technology willingly. And by the time that American companies might have figured out, oh, what kind of strategy they will use, China will still be kind of ahead in their own game. Now, one of the things to really watch for, I think, is when we talk about emerging technologies are actually the big tectonic changes that's actually gonna change everything. And one of the critical moves I think China's making is actually the space industry. Um, because connected with satellites and you know 5G, there are big, big plans for this. And um, there are these satellites at about 1,000 kilometers in the air, so this is not like the geostationary ones, are 35,000, but this thousand or so level is actually where a lot of these, it's been a massive um, down, uh, the prices of these status have really come down, and these are where a lot of broadband internet connection, communication technology is gonna happen, and China's making a big, big push in this sector. The space industry has traditionally been one of the nationals, you know, very, it's the core of national defense. But it's now being there's some private companies and the space industry is exactly the flip of US, where I think most of it's state owned, whereas um, most of US space is actually kind of private. Um, and this 5G is gonna change everything, why? Again, this is connected to another domain that people might not talk about in emerging tech, which is China's Belt and Road Initiative. I don't know how many of you are aware of this. It involves more than 70 countries, the $1 trillion project, uh, it's mostly bilateral agreements. When we talk about China, Africa, or South China Seas, or China in this, and where even China in the Arctic, it's actually all connected to BRI. So one of the things China's doing with BRI that people don't hear too much about is actually what's called a spatial information corridor, and some people call it digital Silk Road. It is going to use 5G to basically bring internet access into landlocked countries that don't have them. Tajikistan, you, know, you think of several countries in Central Asia that are one of these areas very poor, right? They're receiving massive loans and subsidies from China. And this is gonna change everything, right? If China's the internet provider for those countries, it's gonna have that kind of data, it's gonna have that kind of access, and you know, with all technological infrastructure, there's a critical first mover advantage. 
there's a reason why we're stuck with a QWERTY keyboard, even though it makes no sense, right? Because we're used to it, and it was there first. And so very similar with all kinds of like telegraph or typewriting and also with the internet. Once China moves into market, I think, was it Elon Musk, where a, few, a couple months ago, the statement that I imagine 2050 or so, the world will be split into two internet worlds. One's through the West, and the other is China. But China's using a kind of satellite coverage, which is, just very quickly, you know, we build towers, sell towers. Toys is why we constantly have to build more in places where there are blackouts. But in, with satellites, it covers the entire Earth, the, the ones I'm talking about. So there will be no space that's left out. So this is a very, very important move, and I think it will change a lot of things. Um, thank you for your um, thank you for sharing your knowledge um, to this audience. I do have a question. Um, recently, um, it's been on the news that now a lot of um, top U.S. tech companies are um, leaving Huawei. They're not doing business with them anymore. So my question is to you: Is do you think Huawei will can, will sustain itself um, even though tech companies such as Google, Qualcomm, and other and other um, companies are not going to um, um, share their um, technological innovations with um, with that Chinese um, giant tech company? So I think the answer is that we don't know, and we don't know in large part because President Trump has explicitly said that Huawei is something that could be a bargaining chip in a trade negotiation. So putting this company on an export control list exactly as you say, is in some sense an attempted death sentence, despite the fact that, as Jing mentioned earlier, many of these Chinese companies have seen this coming down the pipeline. If you're Huawei or if you're Hike Vision, you have seen for over a year an increasing rhetoric that this could be something the United States would do. Huawei's response has been that they're gonna do it all indigenously, precisely the rhetoric of self-reliance that we've heard about. I think. The question about whether they can, given the extraordinary array of things that they'll have to do and whether they will need to, meaning whether the United States will keep this export control in place or will uh, bargain it away in a negotiation, those we don't have answers to yet. Thank you, sorry. Your comment actually reminds me of something of, of maybe think of something quite important, which is you know the trade war and a kind of amped up rhetoric, it actually perfectly complements this idea of self-reliance. Because time and time again, China has learned is precisely under extreme necessity, extreme pressure, right, under very precarious circumstance, that it is able to pull itself up. That's what Project 748 was about. The Chinese are extraordinarily proud of that project. Um, so I think in some ways it is unfortunate that this kind of, the idea that China might, well, we just know from Xi Jinping today, it, you know, now rare earth elements are gonna be evolved. Um, in, you guys might remember last year, with the September 2018, uh, Trump commissioned a report that looks at the assessment of risk and basically national uh, defense in America. And it's actually drawn a lot from a March 2018 report by a DOD, which assesses basically the, the supply, global supply chain and US dependency. And one of the areas that's actually gonna be quite vulnerable is actually microelectronics. And microelectronics relies a lot on rare earth elements, which has these sort of 17 elements. They actually got it all over, but China has very concentrated amounts because since 1990s, Chinese mining companies have been able to really scale this up because it's cheap to do mining there. Um, so this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt. And so I think in many ways, this is kind of, re so this will only affirm the protectionist self-reliance stance that China has. Now, whether China can do it or not, that was never their question either. They always thought they had to do it. So I think that's kind of a fundamental difference. How, how, how Huawei will fare, though, I am not sure. It is definitely taking a hit. <laughs>